another cosmic salon and i have what i consider my good friend randy <coughs> moggins with me uh and this is as all the cosmic salon- salons an open chat this is not an interview this is us having a little kiki a little chit chat this is us getting on in the way we do and so with that i'm going to bring on randy <laughs> Hey, hello. Conversation. Yeah, I've, um, I'm, sitting, I'm sitting here with a cup of Earl Grey tea, so that should make mm. it a little more cozy. Do you take sugar and cream? Just a little bit of sugar. Just a little bit. Just a tad. I ha- if it's Earl Grey, I have to have a little tad of a little, little bit of sweet in there. Yeah, it cuts kind of levels off the, uh, the, the peak blackness of it, but otherwise, it's not overly sweet. Yeah. No milk. No milk. Yeah. I am drinking tea as well. I drink it straight, but I make weird tea, so I make it with herbs and stuff. So I have ginger in this. I have chaga. I have yeah, yeah, cinnamon, exactly. You know? Yep. Yeah, <laughs> I do chaga tea. Chaga I, tea is a natural antimicrobial, by the way. Chaga is good to us. Oh yeah. The sacred mushrooms are good to us, Randy. Sacred mushrooms. Oh, tell me about it. <laughs> This so, entire world I visited as a result of mushrooms. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Isn't that the truth? Well, it's an alien. People want to talk alien. We should start always with mushrooms. That's the, I think, the the whole Absolutely. situation. Yeah. So for people that may not know, which would be surprising to me at this point, you are the creator of Off Planet Radio or Media. I never am sure... What, what media is it, the media is just a platform that was sort of a it's sort of a business designation. Um, I call it off planet radio TV now. Mm-hmm. Formerly, it's just off planet radio, and most of the time, I just go with that. Yeah, the website, which is sadly neglected these days, is off planet radio.com. And if you search my name or off planet radio, they're synonymous, they'll come up. Yeah, along with you know. A lot of other interesting stuff. Yes. It's you're very easy to find. And anyone can find I'm constantly retweeting you and stuff on Twitter because I love it. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Oh yeah, yeah. No, we have the that's our that's our little clutch there too. The woo 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 Twitter. (laughs) Totally. That's you know, people complain about their Twitter feed, but mine is just filled with people I love. So Yeah. It's yeah, I don't get a lot of aggravation out of Twitter. Twitter's kind of good to me too. Yeah. Same here. So, I mean, this is the thing. We create our world, we create our Twitter. Exactly. <laughs> but I, I asked you on specifically, there's been some stuff you've been talking about. I love the Eye of the Needle series and the recent episode with Lada. Oh, geez. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Uh, and so it's just a constant thing. And you're one of the people that brought into my world the idea of the where the water goes, where water goes. I had very specific 
memories of sitting at the bottom of a pool when I first mm-hmm. talked to you. That brought up something for you to bring to my table, which I was unaware of. And then now that I've dug deeper into that through people like Shane Bales, it seems to be a common theme, the pool thing, sitting at the bottom. I want to hash that out a little. For those of us, anyone listening, that may have these strange memories and are not sure how they could tie into a larger narrative. So my memories of water go back to childhood. And like you, I have a relationship to it. One of the common memories that people have who begin to discover the dark corners of their own past especially if it happens to involve certain projects related to military intelligence and dark science, is something around water. A lot of us, and this was something that early on in our relationship, Emily Moyer and I talked about a lot, both privately and in terms of the show. It was a touchstone memory because I think it's so visceral And it's a memory. To explain water itself is so difficult because it's so common. It's everywhere. Yes. And it's like 90% of our body. And at the same time, we don't really understand much about, I will say, the mystical properties of water in terms of how we interact with it because we take it for granted. Yeah. But the concept of us actually being creatures of water is very difficult to fathom because as mortal mammalian air-breathing human beings, water represents in a lot of ways an existential threat. Um, Not enough of it, we die. Too much of it, we die. It's kind of like how much water is just enough, and it's because uh, we can drown. And we don't really have the ability, we believe, as air-breathing mammals to exist in water and yet this memory isn't just people who have memories of projects it's actually in the genetic memory of the human race yes and we find it through mythology we find it through these imagery of these mer people which to me i mean just think on a simplistic level the little mermaid and how popular that is Mm -hmm. Uh, i don't know any little girl i've got a six-year-old granddaughter And um, (laughs) we've suffered through Little Mermaids (laughs) endlessly. But there's something to it. I grew up reading comic books, and two of my most enduring comic book titles were Aquaman and Submariner, Marvel and DC battling it out. These were characters who were depicted as living in underwater worlds, literally as sort of hybrid beings who could exist underwater, and also exist above water. In other words, they were almost amphibian. And so we have these concepts even of the sinking of Atlantis, and does Atlantis exist at the bottom of the sea somewhere? Is it still an undersea kingdom of some sort? All of these images kind of sit on the edge of our consciousness, and I believe the reminders of something that's very real in terms of who we are as a race of people and where we've been perhaps in other historical slices of dimensionality or alternative pasts and futures. In other words, water itself is something far more mystical and important than we understand. When I got to adulthood and I started to examine some of my inherent fears the main one was really water now i did love swimming and swimming pools i was able always to swim and everyone knows i was born with web feet but i guess that's not uncommon and the story i got when i was a little bit older my mama told me she said it in passing one day i guess they just took the little membrane because you know you're a little tiny newborn and just wiped his finger through each of my toes. It's really terrible getting shoes. They're really wide uh, at yeah, yeah. the front. But, yeah. And I can walk like a Peking duck if I need to. However, I was always comfortable 
in the idea of swimming and I can swim really well. And I was always the best swimmer around, especially when it came into uh, chlorinated waters where I didn't have this weird fear. But then I had these memories of being at the bottom of the pool that are vivid, vivid, vivid. I'll never be able to wipe those out. However, It deepened when we would go to the ocean or lakes, which we did a lot. We were very sporty people. And so I was forced to be in the water and I hated it. I did not like murky water. Weird things are always attracted to me in water. I remember deep sea fishing. I'm the only one who caught an electric eel. Everyone's catching all this other stuff. I pull up the weird stuff. The captain's like, what's up with this child? And I remember being in Daytona one time, and my mom and I, I wouldn't get in the water, so she's. I got on her shoulders. We go out. She forces me down, and I go down, and then all of a sudden, there's all these fish, and then there's this shark alert. So I'm, you know, I'm like, oh, my God. Get, you know, I'm jumping back on my mom's shoulders and we're, we're hightailing it out. And then, you know, years later when I'm there with my husband, we go and it happened to be one of those freak storms when the box jellyfish came in from wherever. And, oh, yeah. and yeah. I'm out there, I'm on like noodles and Scott, my ex-husband just sees these tentacles going off of my shoulder. You know, like they look like glass Chinese noodles. <laughs> Uh Uh next thing i know i'm in the hotel room and he's peeing on me and uh you know what a way to get a golden shower and so so, you know it's just randy it was it's just been a constant in san francisco when i was very young i came to consciousness many times at the sea cliff looking out i not sure Mm -hmm. how i got there I will say, I did do a lot of drugs in San Francisco. I I was a teenager. And so it plays out in my dreams as well. Yeah, big time. Yeah. I have a lot of dreams in water to this day. My relationship with water is, yeah, like you, I grew up obviously in swimming pools. But where I grew up in Pennsylvania, I grew up in the mountains. So there was a lot of, there's a lot of streams and lakes uh, where we live here. Is literally a river valley for this river called the Susquehanna, which is oh, yes. um, a river of dreams that empties into the Chesapeake Bay. A lot of woo really? around that river. Uh, yeah, there's a whole lot going on with that. <laughs> Michael Wan talks about that. The river itself is iconic. Yes. There's mysteries in it. And I grew up beside this river. I mean, literally a half a mile from my house, this river ran and as kids we played in it we played in its tributaries we played in the streams and i grew up in a time at least for me when children weren't so regulated yeah um all the things that we were told not to do of course we did which meant crossing the railroad tracks and going to the river so those that was the top of the forbidden list did both of those routinely (laughs) and the river is kind of emblematic of my relationship with nature and the things of mystery. I have very deep memories of the river. Interesting thing is that this river flows into a confluence at the origin of the Chesapeake. There's a confluence where the river flows down into. There's an island there. That island actually is owned by the army and that particular piece of land is part of what's probably almost i'll say 300 square miles of property owned by the military going up into what's called edgewood arsenal or what you would call aberdeen testing grounds Mm. along with that are the labyrinths caves and underground tunnels that run all through the mountains, hills, and streams of this region. So there's a lot of convoluted memories there in terms of how we travel through the earth and how we wind up meeting water coming out of a cave. Mm-hmm. These are There's a lot of deep mystery around this. I have very specific memories of twice drowning, mm-hmm. literally drowning, and literally being resuscitated 
if anybody's seen the TV series that ran on Netflix called The OA, The Other Angels, is, that's what OA stands for. And that they use basically force drowning to take the child subjects into a, I guess you would call it a near-death, post-death experience to tap into interdimensionality of the soul. So now we're a little closer to something very interesting Yes. in terms of water itself. And the more I studied water and the more I came to understand it, here's a fact. In 2006, a scientist with a Russian surname, I imagine he's probably a Russian scientist working at Oak Ridge National Laboratories, discovered what they are touting as the fourth state of water. And that fourth state of water is quantum. Ooh. They discovered that water under extreme pressure literally can jump through an electron wall, just like the tunneling experiments. This is literally water can tunnel. It can electron tunnel through microtubules, much like the famous blind slit experiments that yeah. were done on electrons. Those tests seem to indicate that the water molecules could exist in either of or both locations on either side of a solid wall formation, and the particular mineral was barrel, mm. which is kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. If you go online, the extracts are there that were released by Oak Ridge National Laboratories, and there's a number of articles online about it. Back in the 19, late 1920s, early 1930s, an Austrian naturalist named Victor Schauberger yes. discovered the plasma properties of water. Schauberger was a naturalist who worked for the equivalent of the Austrian Park Service pre-World War II. And he was studying the spawning of salmon going upstream. Now, most people don't realize that salmon literally swim upstream. Schauberger was noting the salmon could literally swim up an entire vertical waterfall. Yes. He studied this, and as a result of what he found was a layer of plasmic energy that sat at the very top of the water. And anybody who has a relationship with water, <clears throat> if you're attuned, you will soon come to see that water has an aura. Yes. Just like we do. Water is a living entity. It's more than that. But first and foremost, it's living. The salmon themselves were actually able through the use of their own structure, the gills, the fins, the vertebrae, the fish itself, arrays in such a way, very specifically, that it could attach to the frequency of the plasma. They were not swimming upstream. They were literally flying upstream riding the reverse currents of a plasma field that was sitting on top of a cascading waterfall. It's incredible. It's incredible. Yeah, truly. This is one of the things I think that gave me the chills when I would get into natural water as opposed to chlorinated water. I felt this actual sentience with it, that it was alive, that it was conscious in a way that I couldn't understand at the time, but it was able to permeate whatever was going on in my world at different points when I found myself in it and in contact with it uh, that shook me to the bone. And I think on a primordial level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, again, it's that cellular, and I will say DNA level memory. Part of my Eye of the Needle series involves aspects of DNA specifically, and trying to understand the quantum nature of DNA and how it relates to both the state of human consciousness in its present form and the escalation of human consciousness as we go into this next wave. Mm -hmm. And it's very clear that there's a genetic gateway that itself is extra-dimensional and probably attached to the spirit realm. 
So I see a lot of correlation between the mystery of our DNA that's inside our body, this living substance that's all around us, that's within us, that is in itself an information field. I mean, the more we learn about genetics, the more we know that the DNA itself is, is a huge information field. Yeah. And it appears as though the connection on the external world may in fact be water, that water itself stores information and structures it in such a way that it can then be accessed. I know that sounds woo-woo and strange, but my experiences with water have been when I really need to work something out, a lot of times I go near water. Mm -hmm. I immerse in water. I put my feet in water. And it seems to trigger something inside of me that comforts me and also activates a certain energetic level. Mm -hmm. I do this as well. I'll get my feet in and I love a bath. Of course, I'm a bath person with throwing in minerals and stuff, trying to absolutely yep. help the water out, the water that we get served to us. And <laughs> uh, I think, don't you have well water where you are? I don't know. Actually here, no, we're in a very suburban situation here. It's actually almost urban now. At, at any rate, this this is something that I have learned. I need to live by water. So whether it's a creek or a river or an ocean, and I do tend to gravitate towards larger rivers or oceans, I have found absolutely essential in my being. I seem to wither when I'm not within a good proximity of a body of water, a natural body of water. And this is all part of this trying to understand the connection between myself and water. But in this journey, I have discovered so many people have this same feeling without ever having questioned why. It's because of the energy, first off. It's so primal. Our water situation, yeah, I mean... Unfortunately, this place where I live right now, we are using water that's being conveyed to us. That will change this. We're going to, you know, eventually get out of here. Yeah. And one of my goals is to get near water. Yeah. But there are things you can do to remediate that. I filter water. I structure water. Yes. Um, I don't drink any water from taps. Even if I have to buy, which is a second or third choice, I usually travel with my own water. I carry water with me wherever I go here. And it's the water that has been run through filtration system and through a structuring unit. Yeah. And that's what I try to drink because it's the purest form. But there are things you can do. And one of the things that you can do, whether your water is city water, which probably contains chlorine, chloride, fluoride, and all these other things, is first off, you can let it sit which we evaporate off the gases, you can then begin to bless the water and speak to the water. Yes. The water can self-heal. Everybody talks about this, the famous experiments that Dr. Rimoto did of speaking to water and freezing it to see the intentionality as it's structured in the ice lattices. That is a very simple form of what we can do with water on a communication level is speak to it, bless it, chant over it, play frequencies to it. Mm -hmm. and in other words, restructure the water with intentionality and with harmonics, your own human harmonics. Yeah. I have a Berkey and then I filter down and I have Shungite. Mm -hmm. Shungite yep. and all that. And Shungite's very good. Oh, I love it so much for so many things. One of the things that I do with the food I eat as well as the water I drink is I am definitely one of these people that blesses the stuff that goes into my body, even if it's junk food. I try to throw on my intent. So if it's this holy sacred Eminem, <laughs> right? And I'm being bad and I'm having an Eminem. Actually, I don't think of it as being bad and I'm being decadent. Uh, this is something that is a, an intentional form of, transmuting an 
energetic field that I'm going to take into myself. So on a, on the good days, on the best of days, when I'm at my best, of course, I'm not having the sacred eminem. Uh, so, you know, I'm just, that's for jokes, but it, it did happen today, Randy. It did indeed happen today. However, would you go a little bit more into structured water for people? I think that falls into the land of woo woo for some reason. Well, it doesn't, it doesn't. There's actually, and I'm not going to give you any specific brands. If I will just say a few search structured water out there, there are, several people who offer various different types of systems for structuring water. The one that I use is a 3D printed, very simple. It's about the size of a cup that you would fill water with. So it probably holds eight to 10 ounces at a time. Mm -hmm. And inside of it is 3D printed a matrix, a spiral matrix inside of it with nodules. And what this particular unit is doing is simulating the energy of a stream cascading off of rocks. Schauberger's observations were made of water in motion coming over falls. Yes. So that is actually structured water itself because the energy is structuring the water energetically. That's why it's throwing off those plasma fields. That's why moving water is so much more energetic than the still water that you would find in a pond yes. or even the water which is expressed through pipes because they're going through a straight line. Nature does not have straight lines. It goes back to this whole concept of the quantum water moving through solid structure in that energetically it appears water is predisposed to dynamically move through, not just around, under. It's often said water will move to whatever level it needs to move to to continue moving. But really, now it looks like water moves not only around, under, but it's through solid matter. Mm -hmm. So structuring water is simply adding energy to the water. And if you do a web search, there are people out there who sell units. Some of them are quite expensive. But you can get a very simple water structuring unit, one that requires no external energy, one that you can actually stick in your backpack and take with you. And the act of structuring the water is the act of blessing the water. It puts energy into it, which means that that water, when it goes into your body, is interacting with you on a nanoscale as well. Yeah. Our body's tissues are at nanoscale. Yes. You know, that's something we're learning. Um, people know I'm a big fan of C60. C60 operates on a nanoscale in terms of being able to express carbon into the tissue, which in turn covalences with it and enables it to open up to receive more of your nutritional, your herbal supplements, things like that. Your water is doing the same thing. If you even slightly structure it, you're opening it up to move through your body and to begin to super hydrate your body. Yes. And hydration is really important now. One of the reasons why most people get sick is because almost everybody is hydrated. Yes. We drink coffee. We drink energy drinks. We drink soda pop, which is frankly hideous for you. Oh, terrible. We intake a lot of sodium in our food. Nothing wrong with salt. Salt in proportion is good. Fresh and ideally filtered and structured water in as much abundance as you can handle. I mean, obviously, you don't drink until you slosh. Yeah. But <laughs> if you're already feeling thirsty, you're already dehydrated. Yeah. We should be hydrating. And I would say, I, on an average day, I carry a 24-ounce container of my ice which obviously is filtered and structured itself with me and that throughout the day may be refilled two or three times as i go through my day and sometimes even more thirst is the externalized form of your body screaming at you really slow intake of water throughout the day even just little sips and if the water is structured and good 
you're going to convey that through your body at tissue level and ideally at nanoscale. Yeah. And that really helps your body to remain energetic and to be able to fend off nasty little things like, oh, I don't know, engineered viruses put out <laughs> by our own government. Yes, this is how we fight back. I actually use stabilized oxygen in my water during, mostly during cold and flu season. I've found that is definitely very beneficial. You know, this is, of course, we're not medical practitioners, so just saying not. that. I find that very beneficial on top of of filtering it and getting the shungite in. And also, the shungite has the fullerens in it, so I don't know the difference in getting the fullerens, the C60 carbon, from having shungite in your water. Does that transmit in a way, to us? I don't think it does, no. Not I mean, the way Shungite it does with works. the oil. No. The oil is very different. Yeah. Basically, the oil is going in and just, it's opening it up. It's giving you that buckyball molecular formula, which, again, is at nanos, nanoscale. You can check the science behind it from Rice University. Yeah. As to the benefits, I'm not pushing this. I mean, I very rarely talk about it. But my experience, what I've been doing is I've been using it along with other things that I partake on a regular basis. I'm using fulvic acid right now in the form of shilajit. Yes. Oh, I love which is yeah, a, shilajit. Which is a, a tar <laughs> substance. I get mine online and it's from the Himalayas. Yeah, same here. And this is just, you know, this stuff is, is literally the earth. It's You're amazing. All of, <laughs> our biome needs these kind of things. What I say to people is you've got to find what works for you. Your body will talk to you. Just as you can talk to the water and get information from the water, when we become smart and intelligent with our bodies, our bodies will talk to us. And when we're in crisis, that's our body screaming at us. And I'm saying this to somebody who's gone through a number of health crises over the last few years yeah. as a result of ignoring the fact that, oh, that's right, you actually are human. You do have to eat healthy, <laughs> sleep, not smoke cigarettes, <laughs> and once in a while actually take care of yourself. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, it is. That's how I came to uh, understanding health at a way different level than I was brought up with, even though I was brought up with my mama was very kind of, I guess, hippie-ish in that we went to the the health food store and she was very into that kind of stuff, which was very, considered hippie-ish when I was growing up. And That's so awesome, yeah. I did have that side of it, but at a different level. I'm way deeper than she ever went, but I'm also now older than she was when she died. So, yeah, the she legit, which is how I say it, is essential. It's also in my tea right now. That's one of my daily... Mm. tea tonics yeah. tea that i make i make just one pot a day and i have it's probably like a four four pot four cups of tea big cups and i have two of those while it's warm and then i let it sit overnight and it becomes a concoction then in the morning i drink the rest because it's now done that concoction thing and the standard for sure chaga shilajit i'm a big fan of the good cinnamon for the blood mm -hmm. and yep. the heart, right? Yep. yep, exactly. I use cinnamon in all of my teas. Yes. Oh, it's so amazing for your blood and insulin resistance in your heart. And then uh, turmeric and ginger, and you have to have the pepper with the turmeric. Ah, yeah. That, that's a key thing people forget. It helps you absorb it. And then other things will come and go. But that's kind of my standard tea. And then, of course, tea, real tea. I do loose leaf. I found, like you, I think like a lot of us, it takes coming in contact with the fact that your shell is like a car. <laughs> you don't give it oil, you're going to find out what happens. When you get caught in the allopathic system and how derailed that is, oh, everything may say I'm healthy, but I don't feel healthy, I don't look healthy, there's nothing here that's suggesting I'm healthy, but you're telling me I need to take these meds. And that's where my journey began. And it started first and foremost with the liquids. That's when I cut out the sodas. 
that's when I cut out all that kind of stuff and just started going towards waters and teas and coffees at one point. But I stopped the coffees and I love coffee. But I decided why I love coffee is because I like it with half and half or cream. <laughs> Uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> and so, yeah, so yeah. When, when my ass was like a size 16, I said, okay, <laughs> <laughs> girl, this is, this is where the, the cream stops. And so it was restructuring. One thing led to another. And I started to realize, oh, dairy may not be my friend for my body type. Well, yeah. You know, and this is one of the things with all this is where I believe with all the different environmental factors and then genetic stuff that goes on, we're all a little different and there is no one size fits all. Exactly. Yeah. In our house with my wife and I, we're very different people. We have different body types. We have different blood types. Our dietary preferences are vastly different. Our menu is grounds for divorce sometimes, but (laughs) um, we've worked that out because we're both conscious of where our needs are in terms of nutritional and mostly organic food as much as we can do that, finding good food yeah, and eating it in moderation and eating it with thankfulness and joy. Yes. Well, that's what I wanted to talk about. The idea of blessing the water is a big deal. And it goes back a long way, say, with Gnostics and Catholics and other esoteric minded people that recognize that water is more than a liquid you take in. It's been there all along, blessing the holy water. I mean, it's been in our faces this whole time, and yet for some reason it escaped from us when we were looking at it in the mundane level as something being served on the table that you had to drink with dinner. You know, even if you go back and read the mystical texts, Water is present in all of this. I speak more from the sort of westernized, you would say, Christian view, although I don't really follow that as a religion, but it is my roots. But if we look at the ancient rites, for instance, of mikvah, which is practiced by Jews and Hebrews, baptism. baptism. If you just read the New Testament account of the baptism of the Christ by John the Baptist, Mm. And you see the mystical vision there of him going down into the water and coming up. And when he comes up, the spirit is upon him. And he's literally, his light body lights up. It's like, whoa, that's some shit (laughs) going on there, man. (laughs) There's something to this. That immersion in a highly activated body, somebody who had the ability to transmute energy within themselves Coming up from interacting with highly energized water, what would you expect? Yeah. You would expect that aura to expand and just absolutely glow. Yeah, absolutely. When we start talking about this kind of experience that we see with John the Baptist in the water and rising out, I cannot separate. I can, but it just is always there, this idea of the shining ones and what all that is. And that's another thread that I follow in my life that I uh, search and seek out in other people organically without making cattle calls for who's had a shining one experience. It seems to be tied in with this idea of getting into a state of health that starts at the basic level with the fact that We are water. So much of us are, we're water and carbon. And this Mm -hmm. is a very big deal on an origin level. Yeah, those are the two elements right there. Water and carbon. The constituent parts of that being hydrogen, oxygen, carbon. The building blocks of all physical creation. The temple. And so the idea of the shining ones comes forth. The, The shining one is referred to in the, I call it an allegory or a fable in the book of Genesis with Adam and Eve and what's called the serpent in the garden or the shining one, the nakash. Uh, the shining one is really uh, the Hebrew word nakash mm-hmm. and that was translated as serpent. And that becomes, there's so many problems with how we portray imagery. There's a whole world out there 
that the minute you mention snake or serpent or reptilians or reptiles, I mean, we go off into like this dark world of absolute shit Mm -hmm. because people don't understand that our language, first off, our language is corrupt. Yeah. Uh, We do not have the true meaning of words because they've been, they've come down through numerous translations, most of which have been horrible. But the imagery itself is preserved in symbols. And this is something I'm starting to write and talk more about now is how we translate symbols because symbols are like water. They contain encoded information Mm -hmm. that we're still trying to push through our left brain logic gate and out of our language chute using a language that has very reduced ability to express concepts. Our modern languages are all dumbed down. Mm -hmm. This is kind of the Tower of Babel kind of thing where the tongues were confused. But our most potent language is the language of symbolism. (laughs) And I always think of Joseph Campbell's work and all the things that he was decoding through mythology. So when we look at something like the Shining Ones and we look at it through the imagery of the Garden of Eden and what's called the fall of humans, we're looking at something in a very reduced way that has a greater meaning to it. That these Shining Ones are present in history. Mm -hmm. And what and who they are has to do with how we interact with a world that mostly we don't see with our natural eyes anymore. I had an experience early on. It actually changed the trajectory of my life. I'm definitely not getting into it in this hour. I may in the next. And <laughs> I've talked about it before also. I think for me, when I look back at that experience, there's a big water tie-in, and that's the reason why I bring this up. I was away in Wisconsin with my grandmother. We were at a lake There was fishing. It's the first time I was taught how to gut a fish. And so water was really heavily involved with my encounter that I had. It was very, very young, maybe six. As I said, it changed my life. It also gave a very upset and hard-played early childhood some hope as well, that there was more going on. And that it wasn't all torture and bad, that there was something bigger right, right. at play. Yeah. It's in that time period that I have my memories of being at the bottom of a pool. You know, it was like a, it seemed like a, a re, like a pool, like a public pool or something, you know? And I don't recall. So I would always do this. There would I'd find myself at public pools, and I'd go down and sit at the bottom, expecting whatever had happened in these other experiences to happen, which was a, a type of portal experience that was very washed, to use almost a pun here, in my memory. Like I knew that there was something to that. There was something about that, but I you're probably dealing with a screen memory too. And a lot of yes, that's what where we I wanted remember. to go. Yeah, a lot of what we remember in those experiences were heavily screened mm-hmm. to protect both us and quote them. Mm-hmm. It's not a great plan because, as we've come to know, over time the subconscious begins to float imagery back up and as you recapture memory a lot of times detail begins to kick in and you can fill in those screen memories on a core level what you experienced it you would say that you experienced something that simulated the experience of being in water underwater and experiencing something where you were not threatened by this but in fact it was an empowerment which means in all likelihood, it was some gateway, some portal that opened up that and you were able to then go through Yes, as a result of being in that element. And as you said, you know, I've emailed you over these years and with different things because memories have come up. The more I've talked with some other people, I was very insulated from so much of this. 
and just had these fantastic stories that I would talk about, but I had no one that I could connect with, really. That's what's been going on for a lot of years now. For me, it opened up when I began talking to other people. The internet has been a blessing for this. Yes. Oh, I because so agree. people who stepped out and began to talk about these experiences, they were ridiculed, they were slapped down, mm -hmm. uh, censored. And feared. <laughs> and feared. <laughs> and truthfully, there's a lot of trauma involved. But what people don't understand is that these projects ran from the 1950s until now. Yeah. They're still running projects. It swept into its web people from all walks of life, all levels of abilities because of what they were looking for, and all levels of programs. The one thing I want to say about this, because... It gets lost in the dialogue about projects. MK Ultra was an extreme program. It was a military program designed specifically to procure and create super soldiers with trauma-based mind control programming mm -hmm. and split personality segments. In other words, basically the blueprint of the Manchurian candidate. Yeah. And Walter Bower wrote about this in Operation Mind Control in the early 1980s. And that was the extreme arc of this. There were hundreds of sub-programs, and I'm being conservative here, that fell under the umbrella of Project Talent. Mm -hmm. They were things as simple as identifying who had psychic skills, yes. who had linguistic abilities, who was able to operate on symbolic levels, that's kind of my background, mm -hmm. is that I recall being tested and largely used in terms of symbol interpretation, semiotics, language, and psychic and empathic skills. Yeah. So, I mean, you would call that a soft program. I can tell you they weren't soft programs, but relative to the brutality of uh, MK Ultra and what has been presented about it, we're talking about programs that were, they weren't one thing. They were running these things very much on a project by project basis to just locate the people who would be able to give them the specific skills that they were trying to isolate. Yes. And a lot of this had to do with water. Victor Schomburger himself was conscripted by the Nazis for what he knew and what he was beginning to develop as a result of studying the plasma fields of water in the 1930s. The idea of the internet, too, is very fluid, right? It's water-like. So it's a blessing for me, as an introvert especially, but having come from a very dark past to find others, I can immediately tell who's, who's who. I think most of us <laughs> can. I don't want to be... I'm not standing in judgment, but there, it just right. seems like there's a lot of... Years ago when I was doing a lot of interviews, and I originally started out with Off Planet Radio doing UFOs and mind control. Mm -hmm. And the manifesto that I wrote at that time is probably still online, but I always said, I will believe you. Yeah. Because I felt it was important for people to understand that I didn't need to judge something. The act of putting whatever it is into the public record will prove itself ultimately true or false. Yes. And we've seen this. We've seen people, you know, who have exposed themselves for being frauds, for mm -hmm. putting out false information. I'm interested in the broken narratives of people who have fragments, who have memories, who can't put it all together. Yeah. Those, to me, are the most compelling stories because what we've done in this sort of ad hoc project online is we've gotten now kind of a consensus there's enough people i mean to this day i will read information from somebody i've never talked to never read before and i will go oh my god yes the ring of truth is totally there on that i get this mm -hmm. and it may be in the language it may be in the actual thing that they're putting out there's an energetic imprint to the truth yeah I agree. It's a vibe, too. Yeah. I mean, that's the energetic part. At this point, because of people like you blazed a trail, it's easier for me to just hone in on. I started doing this because I wanted to find others like me. 
without giving away all my pearls. Right. You know what I'm saying? And so I didn't come out blazing saying, I have this story and that story. I have layered it out. Although people in my life know these stories, these stories have been part of the narrative since I could talk, and I've been talking ever since. This stuff that I'm looking for is very specific, and so when I encounter someone, someone like, say, Shane Bales, where I'm like, this is a brother. This person has had, I mean, I know this experience, and that's that's what I'm looking for. Or something, say, you know, Lot has done this for me too. And and others, you know, you and others. And so that's the stuff I'm putting forth. And slowly I've just been trying to bead together my own story. Because the memories are so bizarre. If you go back and look at, like, my old blogs, all my writing is about strange stories that are memoir going back years and years and years before I started doing this kind of thing. And I was putting it out in creative writing and poetry, but always as a hashtag memoir. And now I'm starting to notice with the shift in the collective conscience, with the confrontation of the collective darkness, that there are definite beacons that are rising into and out of the fogginess and into Mm -hmm. and out of this hazy darkness. And I'm seeing them. They're there. They may not have a voice, but they're there. And something collective is happening that is very big. It's very big, and it's going on right now all at once. In the 10 years that I've been doing this, there aren't too many weeks go by that somebody doesn't reach out I've had, I don't know how many phone calls, Skype calls, email exchanges with people who just wanted somebody to know they experienced something. Yes. Something that they obviously were still grappling with and something that they themselves couldn't quite put the pieces together. And so in a lot of ways, what I did was I basically opened a door for people who might not do an interview. The interesting thing is, you know, there's some fantastic interviews I could have had over the years. I won't exploit people and I don't push them to say anything they don't want to say. Yeah, that's very important. If somebody comes to me with their story, I will listen to it. I won't correspond with them on whatever mode they're comfortable with and the confidential files that i've accumulated over the years on encrypted hard drives which i will never share with anyone they were part of research but they were also part of of authenticating a base of information that then could be put out in, in different ways that we could begin to build an information field So each one of those people, whether they ever did an interview or not, contributed to the information field in ways they probably don't understand. Yeah, that's what's going on for me behind the scenes, too. And I'm always happy when someone's willing to talk. Ultimately, Randy, helping me with my understanding of what went on. That's really the bottom line. And that's how this little light of mine shines, right? We have to celebrate that because, to be honest with you, there's a lot of, quote, us that aren't here anymore. Yes. The mortality rate, and specifically what you would call the suicide rate, is very high for people who have come out of these projects. Yes. I have been down like that. Oh, yeah. I mean, absolutely. You will not be authentic to yourself and to understand what that was inside of you that wanted to take your life. Yeah. That's a program. Yes. And I've lost a lot of friends over the years as a result of these programs that run, and eventually they can't reconcile anymore, and there's too much darkness. The point of it all is basically to be an outlet for this, that people know they're not alone, that what they've experienced is real, because... The most maddening thing of all is going through your life with memories that make no sense that you don't believe are real. 
Yeah. And that you can find the validation for. That is a good place to wrap up this first hour, by the way. Great. If people want to reach out to you and tell you their stories or find you, how do they do this? The best way is email. And that's Randy at OffPlanetRadio.com. You can find a lot of information on the website at OffPlanetRadio.com. The website, it's not updated right now. It will be soon. But my contact information is there as well. And that's probably the simplest way to do it. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Twitter and Instagram. This is the end of this first hour, which is a good place. And we'll see the rest of you on the other side. And there he goes, Randy Moggins. That was a fantastic first hour. The second hour gets very deep and intense. I talk about one of my core memories, and Randy responds to that. I'm going to be doing that more behind the veil, of course, releasing some of these fantastical stories and memories cover memories as they may be later as everything unfolds but we certainly get into one i would like to thank producers of this show michael watcher melanie poe christy tesmer and marin kramer i from the bottom of my heart thank you for your support as well as all the patrons through my Patreon that make this possible and extremely exciting. So thank you. And remember, there's a light, it's your light, and it shines. <laughs>